Today we're going to discuss core democratic values. A core democratic value is a value or an idea that is essential to American democracy. <clears throat> now that's not to say that the government or every single member of the government believes in these values or that they get followed at all periods in time, but these are the ideas and values that are essential to American democracy. So in a perfect world, at all points in time, politicians, citizens, private individuals, everybody should in theory try to follow these values as they are the core makeup of the United States. So if we look at core democratic values, we can look at our goal for today to understand the values that are essential to American democracy. We're going to start out by looking at the value of popular sovereignty. Sovereignty means who has the power of or authority to govern. And so when we talk about popular sovereignty, we're talking about popular meaning people. The people in the United States are the source of power within our government. Not the government, not some ruler, not some elite, but the people are the source of power in American government. And this, of course, is different from other nations. For example, if you look at Great Britain during the time of the American Revolution, the king was the source of the power, not the people. If we look at uh, many theocratical governments like Iran, the religion is the source of power. But here in America, we believe that people are the source of power within our government. Another value that we hold dear is the idea of limited government. Limited government means that there are limits to what the government can do. The government is not all powerful. The government can't just do whatever it wants. And so a key part of limited government is the concept of rule of law. And rule of law means nobody is above the law, not even the president. We know with the case of Richard Nixon and the Nixon tapes, as you may have learned about in another class, uh, U.S. history. Even Richard Nixon was required to give up the secret recordings from the Oval Office because nobody in America is above the law. Everybody, whether it be the highest of the high politicians, the richest of the rich businessmen, or the poorest of the poor on the street, everybody in America must follow the law. The government can't do whatever they want. They must follow the law. We also have an idea known as separation of powers. This is one that we're going to come back to over and over again, so please make sure you know this. Uh, separation of powers means that there needs to be three different branches of government, three different sources of power in our government. So we have a legislative branch to make the laws, an executive branch to enforce the laws, and a judicial branch to interpret the laws. As the year goes on, it'll become apparent what exactly that means, but I think it's important to note that these are separate groups of people that are making the laws, enforcing the laws, and interpreting the laws. This is very, very different from the British system back in the day, where the king was the one who made the laws, and he was the one who carried them out, and he was the one who enforced the laws. Uh, as Montague, Montesquieu has pointed out, uh, this is not a very effective way to do things. If you have somebody who has absolute power and control, that certainly is not the way to end corruption within a government. You can read these are a list of separation of powers. I'd recommend maybe you pause the video, take a chance to look at them. We'll talk about what each of these means later on in the unit. And again, another way of looking at separation of powers, we have a legislative branch, sometimes known as the Congress. Their job is to make the laws. We have an executive branch in the American system, the president. His job is to enforce the laws. And we have a judicial branch, in the case of America, the Supreme Court, to interpret the laws. And again, here we have the same idea of separation of powers, but we take it to the next level with our next value, checks and balances. What checks and balances means is that not only do we separate the power between the executive, legislative, and judicial, but there are certain things that each branch of government can do that the other branches of government are not permitted to do. And again, I recommend that you pause and read over what some of these are. As we go through the course of the semester, uh, we'll explain these in a little bit more detail. But essentially what checks and balances does is it says that each branch has the power to check up on or basically act as a babysitter to another branch. 
So, for example, the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court is appointed by the president, but the check or the babysitting function is that the legislative branch, the Congress, has to approve the judicial branch. They have to approve any nominee that the president makes. And so those are ways that we check up on the power to make sure that no one branch of government gets too much power. Again, if we look at legislative branch, executive, and judicial, there are different things that they can do to check up on each other. So, for example, the president appoints a Supreme Court justice, but it is job of the legislative branch to approve that appointment. Another key check and balance, the president can recommend legislation, can recommend a new law to the Congress, but essentially it is the job of Congress to make the law whether or not they follow the president's recommendation is up to them. And then the president has the right to check up on Congress by either approving or vetoing a law. And if the president does choose to veto a law, there is another check on that power where Congress can override the president's veto uh, with a vote in Congress. So these are ways that the branches check up on each other. Once a law is written, uh, of course, we know that Congress has the right to write a law, to make laws, but the Supreme Court can declare a law unconstitutional, another check and balance. The legislative branch, the Congress, creates lower courts, any court other than the Supreme Court, and that is a way that power is checked. Uh, legislative branch, the Congress, has the power to impeach the president which is a check on the president's power. And so we see a number of different checks and balances. Your book had this diagram, which shows you, again, the same idea of some of the checks and balances that take place within the system. Another idea that we have in America is the idea of private ownership. And in order to understand private ownership, uh, I ask you to turn to the idea of the tragedy of the commons. If you were to go to the school bathroom right now, how would you describe it? My guess is probably pretty dirty and pretty nasty. In fact, that's the way we could describe most public bathrooms. On the other hand, for most of you, your private bathroom within your home is pretty well taken care of. And this comes to the idea of tragedy of the commons. When everything is owned by the public, there is no incentive, there is no driving force or factor to try to really encourage you to take care of property. On the other hand, if you have private ownership, private property, one of the hallmarks of American core democratic values, we have the right to basically more incentive to take care of our land and take care of our property. And so if you ever ask yourself, why is the school bathroom nasty, but my bathroom at home is pretty clean, well, you have the incentive to not be disgusting in your bathroom at home. On the other hand, at school, you hope that somebody else will clean up after you. And that's why our bathrooms sometimes are pretty gross. Judicial review. Uh, judicial review is a power that the Supreme Court basically gave to themselves in the Supreme Court case Marbury versus Madison. And what judicial review means is that the Supreme Court has the right to review any law and decide whether or not it is unconstitutional, to decide if any laws violate the Constitution. And if a law violates the Constitution, the Supreme Court has the right to shoot it down. This is one of the checks and balances we talked about. There are some other core democratic values that we have, things like the idea of majority rules but minority rights. What this means is we're a democracy. We take a vote, and whatever a majority of the people, whatever more than 50% of the people want, they generally tend to get their way. However, there are still rights of minorities. And I think probably the best way of looking at this is directly after the Civil War, uh, slavery. A majority of people in the Deep South wanted slavery. If you would have asked, I think it was like 75 to 80 percent of people in the Deep South wanted slavery to be the rule of law. On the other hand, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights says that people including slaves, have rights, and one of those rights is to not be property. And so just because a majority of people wanted slavery doesn't mean they got their way. We still have to respect the rights of the minority. We believe in individual rights. In our country, we focus more on the individual and not on the group. 
Other countries like the Soviet Union or Russia focus more on the betterment of the group and not on the individual, and that's a huge difference. We believe in the idea of equality. Uh, that doesn't mean equality of outcome, but in equality of opportunity. Uh, so whether it be political within government and voting, legal as far as your legal rights go, uh, social or economic equality, we believe that everybody should have an equality of opportunity. Not necessarily an equality of outcome, but an equality of opportunity. And then again, if we look at this idea of equality of opportunity, whether it be employment or housing or education, everybody should get a fair shot and a fair shake at things. Doesn't mean you're going to be equal in the end, but everybody should have a fair chance. We also believe in the idea of federalism. Federalism is the idea of shared powers between a national and state level government. So federalism, or the government F word as I like to call it, is the idea of shared power between the 50 state governments and the national government. As we'll later learn, there are some things that only the national government can do, some things that only the state government can do, and some things that they can both do. So for example, the national government is the only part of government allowed to print money. The 50 state governments are the only parts of the government that are allowed to issue licenses, like a driver's license. But when it comes to something like taxation, both the national and the state level governments can do both. So shared power is another way of looking at federalism. We believe in the idea of constitutional government, the idea that the form of our government and the structure of our government is written in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We believe that the goal of our government is to improve the general welfare. That doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect, but we're going to try to make things as best as we can. We believe in the idea of safety and security, or what the uh, Declaration of Independence and Constitution will call domestic tranquility or provide for the common defense. So to make sure we are not only safe here at home from foreign enemies, but we're also safe within our own country. We believe in the idea of justice, doing what is right, and we believe in the idea of liberty, or a fancy way of saying liberty is freedom. So these are some of our core democratic values. Uh, thanks for joining me today, and I hope you have a wonderful day.